Welcome to the After On Podcast. I'm Rob Reed. And I'm Tom Merritt. And this is a special episode designed around the book, After On. Each of these special episodes focuses on one aspect of the science, tech, and social issues explored in the novel. Now, you don't have to read After On in order to learn from or enjoy these podcasts. That's because we wait until the very end to discuss the book in detail and to really tie it to this week's topic. That last section will make perfect sense if you're reading the novel. But if you're not reading it, just tune out at that point. You can always come back if you decide to read it later. And we'll warn you before we get to that part. But first, we have a lot of things to talk about, which should be interesting to everybody. Specifically, this week, we're talking about augmented reality, or AR. This is a big topic in the first 51 pages of the book, which we'll discuss in detail toward the end of the podcast. For now, suffice to say that Rob writes about an AR rig that seems very science fiction-y, or at least it did to me, only it sounds like this technology may only be five years off. So... To give people the reality behind the fiction, Rob sat down with Marone Gribbets, CEO of Meta, one of the three leaders in the augmented reality field. So, Rob, you and Marone are talking about the real augmented reality device that people could get or at least pre-order today. I mean, it's kind of being used, isn't it? Yeah, there are lots and lots of corporate customers right now. and They're generally using it for internal applications that they're developing on their own. There's not like the equivalent of Microsoft Word shipping on it yet. There aren't any shipping apps. People are developing stuff. And so Maroon and I talked about his company, Meta, an actual augmented reality company, where it came from, uh, what it's up to now, how the, how the technology actually works. But I also wanted Marone to give us a picture on the ethical issues connected to AR that are, we're going to have to deal with in public spaces. So that's another topic. So beware, he will, in his own words, hack into your brain in this interview. So let's find out what Marone Gribbets has to say about AR. So, Marone, thank you for sitting down with me. My pleasure. Looking forward to this. It's great to be here in your gorgeous San Mateo offices. Did you tell me GoPro used to be here? Yes, this was uh, the GoPro HQ, and now they moved up the hill next to Tesla. Interesting. Uh, yeah. yeah. I wonder if they'll ever do anything with AR, you know, with this sort of extreme sports folks that, that comprise their top end of customers. I mean, some of those people might want readouts of their speed and their scores and so forth while they're flying around. Yes, we are thinking about uh, s- uh, sports augmenting interfaces, Yep. Um, and there's a lot of demand for that. Yep, that makes sense. Um, So to start with something super basic, what is your favorite definition of augmented reality? Augmented reality is uh, one's ability to immersively stick digital information on the world in 3D and be able to interact with that with one's hands and look away and look back and that information is still there. This is a technical definition, but from a more philosophical definition, it's the ability to augment one's cognition with uh, meta information, a layer of meta information about the real world embedded in the real world. And you are coming to this from a neuroscience background, correct? Correct. I think what differentiates meta most deeply from all other companies in this space is that we're trying to come at this paradigm from a scientific uh, direction rather than from a design or imaginative direction. And uh, yeah, that, that that's a whole other can of worms to crack open with you shortly. For now, let's talk a little bit about where Meta itself came from. You were studying neuroscience at Columbia, correct? Correct. And you were, you were, um, were you an undergrad at that point? Yes. You'd been in the military, correct, in Israel for a period of time and then came out as an undergrad in the U.S.? Yeah, I was in the Special Technology Unit of the Israeli Intelligence Corps Mm -hmm. uh, uh, during my mandatory service in Israel. Uh, And then after that, I went to Columbia, studied computer science and neuroscience. Um, Much to the dismay of my Jewish parents, I quit uh, one semester before graduation with those two degrees Mm -hmm. um, and uh, went after my dreams here in Silicon Valley. But how did you get started? Because it started when you were in the dorm with a Kickstarter, am I right? Correct. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Tell us about that, because that's kind of a cool story. I uh, was hacking at this uh, after hours, after I would complete my classes. When I say hacking, I mean this very literally. I took a knife and cut into a pair of 3D stereoscopic optics 
to glue in mag dots, which I sourced from a, a local hardware store. My friend Karen, who's now our vice president of logistics here, oh, really? sourced these magnets from the corner hardware store. Sourced, at, in, I like that in, word. In Harlem, exactly, yeah, right? She sourced it at the hardware. You mean right. she bought the, yeah. And she sourced a, a, a tuna sandwich for me while Excellent. she was at it no, next door. Um, and so the depth sensor, which tracks one's hands, this is a camera that tracks the, the orientation of one's hands, was glued on top of this uh, uh, glass. Glass. And in order to cut through the, the plastic, we indeed had to dip the knife in the fire in that stove of that one better apartment. That's how augmented reality, commercial augmented reality was born. Got it. Got it. And when was it? When did it start shipping the Meta One? The Meta One sh began shipping in 2013. Got it. Yep. So this was a, a couple of years before the HoloLens and... Um, and this was, I guess, concurrently with uh, Oculus Rift and, and some other... And you had a lot of customers, right? Like a lot of companies and a yeah. lot of developers in that first... How many was it? Was it a couple thousand units yeah, that you did through the Kickstarter? It was approximately that. It was 400 companies from 20 different verticals. Um, really, the big discovery from this was... You know, I had thought coming into that Kickstarter that it was maybe 50% entertainment, 50% yep. productivity as a paradigm. But I quickly realized that 80% of our customers came from productivity and um, only five or so percent were interested in entertainment, maybe 2% in gaming. So I knew very early in the paradigm what it was for. People uh, sought to improve their productivity, their creativity um, through these augmented reality devices. Yeah, that, and that's one of the things that I feel is very distinct about you versus some other augmented reality companies, which we'll talk about later, um, is that you do have this more or less relentless focus at this point on productivity over entertainment. And many people think of AR, they think primarily of entertainment. Yeah. Certainly things like Pokemon Go out there as being sort of the, the sort of like pre-AR-like things that we're playing around with. A lot of that is entertainment. But you're very, very focused on productivity. And you interviewed, that came from interviewing a lot of these original users, correct? Correct. I uh, had conversations with all 400 of those companies and, and the Meta Tooth. More Seriously, than, more, all 400. Yep. We, we were very, very rigorous around collecting this data. And I would ask each company, I would navigate my way as high up the ladder as I could. Some Fortune 500 companies gave me access to their sea levels. Other companies were like, go meet this you know, director of research. And it doesn't matter. From, from my perspective, I learned a ton. And I asked them, what are, wh why did you come into this paradigm so early? What's your killer apps? Why do you think someone in your industry would pay $1,000 for this, et cetera, et cetera? And I started seeing patterns across all of these verticals in the data, and I'm uh, happy to share some of these. Yeah. The top few verticals, I would say, were auto, aero, probably design, uh, architecture, and maybe education, you know, these roughly corresponded to the five verticals. And um, I'll give you some stories of companies. I So when I spoke with Harvard and Stanford med schools, they said, we bought this to an, visualize anatomy in a teaching scenario. So I could onboard a med school student and we can explode a cadaver replacement, essentially. Okay, that was an interesting data point. Made a lot of sense, kind of commonsensical. Then Toyota, Mazda, pretty much every auto company in the planet, except for, I think, Renault, uh, said, we want to replace our collaboration around design process. So instead of those clay mold, clay molding process, we should, we should have uh, the ability to, to do that, but without spending $10 million per facility. <laughs> Why not? Um, and photorealism, right? So we could, we could get to the photorealistic design process sooner, even before we 3D print our first uh, print. So... Um, that was interesting. And then uh, a company like Airbus said, hey, we want to onboard a mechanic to learn how to, tr to train to service a cockpit without having to 3D print its parts. And so um, after a certain amount of these companies, I just stopped saying, how do you describe this app you want? But I started asking them what features they wanted. And it turned out pretty much unanimously, people wanted a 3D model viewer that's collaborative. So it turned out from... A deep analysis of this data, over 50% of the customers wanted a product that would help two stakeholders in a company transmit ideas to one another more effectively with yeah. higher bandwidth. Because it turned out that words were not enough for, uh, for these customers. So they wanted that photorealism to, to share ideas. 
Now, contrary to you, some of your competitors are focusing on AR's entertainment potential rather than productivity. Magic Leap, for instance, so they haven't shipped a product yet, they at least appear to be very entertainment focused. Would you say that's a fair statement? Yes, I would. And they've raised over a billion dollars to your hundred million. Now, someone who's aware of this and who's also played Pokemon Go might just conclude that AR is all about entertainment. How would you sell that person on the notion that it's really all about productivity? Yeah, I think rather than selling them, I would point them to history and I would uh, suggest that if we look at those earlier paradigms that this, this form factor is an extension of, the desktop, the, the, then the mobile computer, then the, the phone and smartphone, etc., there's a very interesting pattern that emerges. The thing that tends to drive adoption in these early paradigms are productivity-related tools. In, in uh, the Apple II era, essentially at the very beginning, Apple IIs were selling like a dev kit, 20,000 units or so, um, until Dan Bricklin designed VisiCalc. VisiCalc was the first acclaimed killer app. It was a spreadsheet tool that was the ancestor of Excel. I actually cite VisiCalc a lot in my own professional life because I started uh, the music service Rhapsody. Yeah. And so I tell people, well, Rhapsody is to Spotify what VisiCalc was to Excel. And I usually get blank looks. So <laughs> thank you for mentioning VisiCalc because I think it's a great thing to use in an analogy. And you're right. It was VisiCalc that really turned the Apple II into a successful platform. Form, wasn't it? Right, right. And uh, in the 90s, I think on Japanese TV in the mid 90s, Steve Jobs was quoted saying uh, that what made Apple Apple was VisiCalc. And in another interview, he said that uh, if it wasn't for VisiCalc, the interviewer would not be interviewing Steve. Yeah. And it's that profound. So back to Apple II, it's selling like a dev kit, 20,000 units or so. VisiCalc comes around, moves 600,000 units of this bulky, weird looking device. Which costs thousands at that point. Thousands, right. right. Yeah. I, yeah. Over $2,000. And um, the observation was really interesting. When you have a weird looking form factor that people don't know how to use mm -hmm. in, in the early days of it, and it's expensive, I guess, which is the case now with AR2. Right, right. Yeah. Uh, you want to be able to generate a return on your investment pretty quickly. You want the tool, the software that's on this weird piece of hardware to pay back the cost of that hardware within a few weeks or a few sessions, however it may be. So this tool that was designed originally for accountants to crunch numbers allowed every company suddenly to crunch numbers. Yeah. And that crunching improved upon how they did it with uh, either ledgers or uh, command line interfaces, as it were. And that really drove the adoption because I was making more than the $2,000 pretty quickly. Yeah. So VisiCalc is a vertical tool for accountants that mm -hmm. then spreads horizontally across the whole office space, which drives the form factor forward. Then mommy comes home with this microcomputer and the kids look at this device that helped her crunch numbers and they want to start playing and figuring out how they can make, uh, make this a exciting experience for them. That's been pretty much a similar thing. I mean, Steve might have thought that Mac Paint would be the killer app for Macintosh, but it wasn't. It was uh, this uh, desktop tool, that uh, publishing tool that allowed uh, the vertical and then the horizontal office space to adapt and only then did it become a true kind of a entertainment thing so in a sense the budgets are there in productivity if you're going to proliferate an exotic new platform that costs thousands of dollars you know in society someone's got to be saving or making a lot of money off of it exactly and it's not kids with their video games or their sunday cartoons or whatever it is that i mean the stuff that i would do on my dad's mac when he got it and he we got our first mac pretty early he got it for productivity reasons you're dead right and for all the fun that i had playing teeny you know neanderthal video games on the thing there's no way that that was a, an roi that would justify the purchase of that computer right but the productivity stuff did well that's an interesting point yeah and and to that to that point um pokemon go is a very fun game uh to download for free on your existing mobile device with no incremental investment beyond that um, except for maybe some in-app purchases, that's a very different calculus than let me put something new and strange and uh, interesting on my face. Yeah.
So jumping ahead a few years, Meta's all grown up now. Yep. What are just sort of the quick status? No longer statistics? strange and uh, and weird looking headsets. Now cool and now very cool. Iron and sleek. Manians. Yeah, sleek, very yeah. sleek head headsets. Yeah. You're about 150 people. Did you tell me? Approximately. Mm -hmm. And is it primarily here? Is there some engineering in Israel, or is it all U.S. right now? Uh, it's mostly U.S. There is a R and D uh, project in Israel that, just like many other companies, we yep, have. Yep. Um, and how much have you guys raised at this point, or at least how much are you publicly talking about having raised? You've gone through a few rounds of financing, right? Yeah, we, we have, um, we raised over a hundred. Wow. I didn't realize that. That's a good chunk of change. And let's talk about your main product, the Meta 2. First, what do they cost? Meta 2 costs $950. And is that pretty much everything you need out of the box or do people tend to get peripherals and other things that beef it up and bring it up a little bit more expensive? We try and ensure that that's really all you need. The The one thing that you need, just like a, a virtual reality uh, headset, would be a, a, a nice computer with a graphics card. Yeah. And um, how long would it take to get one? If somebody went to your website right now and bought one, there is a wait list, right? There's a pretty massive wait list, yeah. How long is it in months or ballpark? If um, I would say the first large chunk of units is going to go out in July and then they're going to exponentially grow the manufacturing. And um, it would probably take around f probably four months or so to fulfill. What is the most important thing about the Meta 2? What is it that makes it distinct from any other headset that's out there? What do you think is its superpower in a sense? It is more intuitive in a sense that we've spent the last five years really focusing in on this question of what is the most natural aspiring to zero learning curve a way to touch a hologram okay and uh it it turns out that uh there are universal rules to this question and uh, we've documented them patented them put them in the meta 2 inside of a brand new operating environment essentially like graphical user interface of an operating system, if you will. You know, when you get your iPhone, you open it and you have the home screen and you have the ability to navigate and open apps and have folders and things like that. That's what we've designed for the Meta 2 and that will extend onwards that same operating environment. We call it the Meta Workspace. The Meta Workspace is really the most intuitive way to interact with holograms right now. And what is the equivalent of pinch to zoom? So, I mean, you mentioned the iOS. Um, when I think of my first iPhone, it's like that was the revolutionary thing. Suddenly something that felt very, very natural, very grabby. Yeah. I know what to do. Do you have an equivalent to that? Yeah, the answer is uh, in your question, uh, very grabby. We actually call the next chapter of computing after pinch to zoom air grab. Mm. We've observed that when people put on the headsets, they reach out and try and grab the hologram no matter what. It's, it's, it's a universal thing. We've known that for the last three years, four years since our earliest Meta One prototype. So we patented the heck out of that interaction. And we allow you now to pinch to zoom on all three axes by grabbing with two hands, stretching a hologram, rotating it um, as if you're holding a physical object. And that is simply the, uh, the, the methodology. It's so much easier um, than, than anything that's come before it. And to move an object in your field of view and place it in another place, you quite literally grab the air. Yes. And thereby accessing the hologram, which ingeniously knows that your hand has now penetrated the hologram and is therefore grabbing it. Um, now, unfortunately, because we're strictly audio here, I have the benefit, of course, of tr testing out your demo. It is a very natural thing to do. And it does feel very pinched to zoomy in terms of just the logic and the naturalness of it. Now, I know a lot of the other platforms are very gesture oriented. Is that, did you guys use gestures with the Meta One where if the hand does a certain thing, it, it means, you know, flipping the page or clicking the button? You know, we've tried to shy away from the gesture philosophy just for the audience. The gesture thesis states that by flicking your finger as it will, like um, uh, they do with the Microsoft HoloLens. It kind of looks like you're putting out a cigarette. Um, you're clicking on a 2D icon at a distance. That is a gesture one needs to memorize. There's another gesture which mimics 
the uh, flower blooming with your hand, which brings up the Windows um, start menu. So um, we view this as a new taxonomy that has to be memorized and learned um, and therefore uh, takes the user out of their natural flow. Okay, let's go back to the customers that you have now. Sure. Um, they're going to outnumber the Meta One customers very quickly, it sounds like. Big time. Are they the same types of folks? Is it generally people who are developers? Um, is it generally people who are buying this on an experimental basis? Or are there applications that people are accessing right out of the box that basically makes them end users rather than developers or people who aspire to build businesses or products on top of your platform? Fantastic question. So our customers right now divide into two main pools. About 50% of our customers come from the developer community. And 50% of them are enterprise users uh, from these various verticals that bought the Meta One. But now they're one stage of the adoption curve further from where they were back then. Now they're actually interested in piloting end user applications inside of their organization. So ones that they develop themselves within General Motors or whatever it is. Yep. We're going to develop an app. It's going to be very useful for our internal customers, whether they're designers or industrial engineers or whatever it is. So people are basically buying it to create apps for their internal use. Yes. Yeah. But one thing, one service Meta provides that I think is different than other folks is we build those applications that the customers are looking for to about 80%. And we open those applications for those customers, General Motors in this case. They could slap their logo on it, modify it slightly for their vertical. And we build that for them, which saves them about two years of, of work. Um, we build it with the rigor of neuroscience and intuitive computing that we've accrued here. Now, overall, would you characterize Meta as an OS company, as a hardware company, or as, I don't know, maybe a content company, content's the wrong word, like a software company. It sounds like you're, you're building the beginnings of apps, which is very software-like operation. Clearly you have something that if I drop it from a great height, it will hurt my foot if it hits it. So that kind of sounds like a hardware company. But when you really get waxing about meta and what you think you guys are good at, you almost sound like an OS company. I would say that our uh, primary focus is in developing the most intuitive operating system that has ever been built. We believe that because augmented reality is 3D and uh, encapsulating and around the body, there's an opportunity for the mind that has evolved in this kind of a 3D world and the digital information, which has officially become 3D, to map one-to-one -one with each other. Uh, when you're struggling to remember the menu pathway towards a Photoshop uh, brush and customize it, which we've, if we've ever tried Photoshop, remember those first few trials, it's frustrating. Um, that's because there is a fundamental paradox between the 3D GPU that exists inside of your skull and that is used to a mental model of tools and content in the world and this, these flat metaphoric abstractions on the 2D uh, panel of your phone, mm -hmm. as it were. So now that things are 3D, we could, uh, generate 3D holographic tools. We could generate 3D holographic content or 2D content, um, but the interaction with it is is 3D. And so it could start feeling like an extension of your senses for the very first time. Computing is caught up to the mind. So you're more of an OS company. Now, there's two classic models for that. There's the Microsoft approach of letting third parties like Gateway, Dell, IBM, et cetera, integrate the OS into their hardware and that's, of course, the Android model as well. Then there's the Apple approach of really controlling everything. So are you currently shipping hardware out of necessity because there is no gateway or Dell of AR headsets yet? Or five years down the road, are you still going to control the hardware tightly the way Apple does? Yeah, I think that uh, we're going to continue to control the hardware, um, but in a... Um light touch kind of way. Like we don't actually manufacture our own sensors or uh, every piece of the display technology. We actually encourage partners. So let's go out five years. So you're, we're at a point right now where you have to make different trade-offs and compromises in order to have the, the wide field of view and the integration you want. What do you think AR will look like? What do you think Meta will look like five years hence? It will be a strip of glass that will be on your eyes that from the front perspective will be nearly invisible if we're a few feet apart. Oh, the glass itself, like the, the, the eyewear will be The eyewear bear, will be from a front perspective, like a uh, rimless glass, wow. for example. So and, it would be less distinctive than even glasses. Correct. Okay. 
And from the side perspective, there may be a little bit of compute and bulk and maybe a tiny bit of a battery in the back. Uh, but from the perspective of you and me sitting across like this table here, uh, it would be a very natural thing where we look into each other's eyes and digital information won't be there to clutter our discussion. In fact, there may be holograms to the right, you know, where we can both refer to them naturally and mm -hmm. kind of augment our conversation. How many times have we in the last few minutes referred to 3D ideas? Right. Like the Meta One. Imagine the Meta One suddenly appeared here and we can dissect it. Um, you can ask questions about it. We can go much more deeply in our human communication if uh, it moves at the speed of one's visual imagination. And that's what's going to be in five years. So you see it entirely untethered, you know, not invisible, but starting to get less and less visible that quickly. Yes. That's interesting. Uh, what are the things that we need from a technology or a hardware standpoint that we don't have right now that will enable that? Because you're talking about a huge step forward. Is it an optical engineering advance that you expect in the next five years? Is it a deep learning breakthrough or just a couple twists of Moore's law? A couple twists of Moore's law. That's it. I, I wish I had a more exotic answer for you. Well, speaking of exotic, uh, there's a passage in my novel that I'll now describe very briefly for the benefit of those listeners who are not familiar with the book. The scene is set in a San Francisco bar, basically in the present day, although the augmented reality technology maps to what you described as being five years out. So there's a sketchy guy who's wearing very unobtrusive glasses, and these glasses are displaying all kinds of information that no one else in the room knows he's seeing. So he goes up to a young woman who's one of the principal characters in the book, and her entire backstory is revealed to him. Who she is, where she went to school, her credit rating, the fact that she's single, the route she's likely to take home tonight, all that and more is displayed to him. And based on this, he's able to fake connections with her that don't actually exist, like imaginary connections to certain friends of hers that make it seem totally safe to talk to him and to open up to him. Now, this scene totally fictitious for now, touches on something that we'll have to deal with as a society as AR gets widespread, which is that the omniscience that the internet itself has about us as people can get pinned to us when we think we're anonymously navigating the physical world. I mean, it's scary enough when a hacker can learn certain things about your Facebook account from 5,000 miles away. It's much, much scarier when a stalker can learn whatever they want simply by glancing at you in a bar, say. And however illegal that may be in the near future, we know that hackers will figure out how to collapse the distance between the most intimate information about us and our physical persons. How do we deal with this? We have a principle called public by default. Anticipating a world, a dystopian uh, world that you have described, we request that developers create applications that promote public uh, behaviors, behaviors where you can see what I'm seeing. Now, in a scenario in a bar where I'm looking at information about you and you being able to see I'm looking at information about you, you break the asymmetry that was evident with Google Glass, for example, where I could be looking at a Wikipedia page or a Google or a, or a funky photo on Facebook of you, and you would never be able to see that. Uh, that's asymmetry in information uh, transmittance. And uh, if we promote this ideal of public by default, we kind of map to how things are in the world right now, where we've created these social constructs of I'm not going to do anything really, really creepy right in front of your face uh, that pertains to you. Um, and if I am, you'll call me out on it and there'll be this checks and balances. So there's, there's a lot of neuroscience to why that is important, um, uh, mostly because when you're doing things that pertain to me that I can't see, it elicits an anxiety circuit in my mind, and I'm happy to talk about that as well. So that's interesting. So you would envision a situation in which um, what you're looking at in the public's domain is visible to everybody or just visible to people who are concerned with that information? It's visible to everybody. Yeah. Everyone who has a AR glass on should ostensibly be able to see what other people are doing in a public space. Yeah. Of Not course, if you're in your private home, you're in your private home. You're in your yeah. private home. It's kind of like uh, the ethics of, of how things go in, right now. So if I'm sitting with a buddy and, um, and, or let's say I'm sitting with a girlfriend and I get a, a, a floating holographic message from uh, my lover, right? 
uh, there is an, a certain thing that I want to keep private. Um, but what are the, you know, the, the percentage that, 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 that actually happens in real life on a, on an ongoing basis? How many of your interactions throughout the day do you wish to really keep po- po- private because you need to? Oh, I think almost all of them would bore the bejesus out of anybody in my presence exactly. at any given time. Yeah. I know. And there's, so there's, there's this tiny little fraction of things that, you know, you, one could worry about. And, um, if that scenario were true where I have a lover and I'm sitting with my girlfriend and, you know, you could kind of harken back to how things were before uh, computing. Go to the other room and right, do, right. do your do your shtick. But in the in the presence of society and people that you're wishing to respect, um, public by default really solves a lot of problems. But is that your own phrase, by the way, public by default, or is that a term of trade that's used in the AR industry? It's one of the uh, terms that we've defined at, to delineate this exact idea. You and when you say we, you mean you meta? Yeah, we yeah. meta. And it's this- a good phrase. I ask because I think it's a good turn of phrase. I mean, it's it's controversial because we've become as a society so obsessed with this idea of privacy when really the number of interactions that need to be private are so few in, in, uh, in relation to the overall number of interactions we do during the day that wouldn't it be nice to avoid a scenario such as you described at the cost of that one teeny little fraction, yeah. right? Um, you have your phone on the desk right now. It's popping up messages. If one of those messages is a particularly harmful message towards me, I would see that message. And there's some kind of a public by default construct. When things go on your eyeball and I can no longer have access to that, it breaks that symmetry. So would you imagine it is sort of broadcasting or rendering on the on the exterior of the lenses? Or... It would be super subtle. It's just the yeah. message that kind of you see facing you, just like when your phone popped up a message right now, I could see it from the opposite direction uh, as it's laying on its back, more or less the same thing. It's not heavy handed. It's not like, you know, a siren, you're cheating on your wife. It helps us become less anxious about what the other person is doing toward us. There's a circuit in your brain in an area called the TPJ that uh, that shows heightened activation in MRI uh, when someone is doing something, gesturing in midair, doing something that is unresolvable or is that visually ambiguous from the patient's perspective. So if you're doing something like, uh, imagine I'm waving in front of your face right now and I'm sculpting a vase that you can't see, some holographic interaction that you cannot have access to, this TPJ area is going to start firing. And that will start a chain of uh, reaction in your mind um, your striatum, your midbrain will fire error, neur- uh, error neurons within will f- begin firing, which will start uh, a very mentally inefficient process of changing your mental model about the world uh, to believe that maybe it's okay that people would gesture in midair next to you. Well, we've certainly gotten used to people talking to themselves or appearing to talk with themselves. I remember when it I still freaks me out, man. It, it still kind of does. My TPJ does with ain't me too. happy. It's still yeah. It, you know those guys yeah. who are yelling in the in the car right next door, yeah, right yeah. next, in, or the in person traffic. walking down the street by themselves. Yeah. Bob, they, close the sale, Bob. From time immemorial, that was the sign of a crazy person who might do you harm, and now it's like or someone on just, Wall Street, probably just on their cell phone. It is interesting because our our brains do kind of cling to that wiring. Now, I'd like to talk briefly about the competitive landscape. As we mentioned earlier, it's hard to discuss Magic Leap because although they were founded in 2010 and have raised over a billion dollars, they have yet to ship a product. Now, there are a couple of other interesting headset companies, ODG in San Francisco immediately comes to mind, as does Lumos, but they're both Android-based. So when I think of fully integrated OS plus hardware AR platforms, for now, I just think of you guys in HoloLens over at Microsoft. How do you think they would describe their strengths relative to you? I think, you know, I would say their strengths are relative to me. They have a tighter tracking, a locking of the hologram onto the world. Got it. Uh, Years of research by their Microsoft Connect team paid off. Uh, Really, really, you know, props to them. They nailed that. And uh, you you mentioned our strength relative to them. It's the immersion, the resolution, the photorealism. Um, and the intuitive user interface we really uh, see as a, as a strength here. Another strength they have is m- mobility, right? Everything is on the headset. Yeah, they're fully untethered, right? Fully untethered. Yeah. It's a strength and a weakness. It's a strength in that you're free to walk around, but it's a weakness in that you have an Intel uh, Atom processor, a fairly weak pro- CPU processor on board, which means that for a lot of productivity tasks that our Meta1 customers wanted to do, 
uh, that that very lightweight uh, compute would not suffice. Mm. So we've made a very cognizant decision to have a cable at the end of the headset. So you could plug it into a beefy computer one day, a laptop another day, and one day something like a mobile phone mm -hmm. uh, would be able to have the, the compute power to, to juice the whole headset. So we would allow that what we call scalable compute. And then when you want to leverage an entire server farm to perform an immensely complex calculation, you could plug it into that just as easily. So you have a lot more horsepower on your head, which you, which you gain by giving up tethering yeah. or by accepting tethering, I guess, is you can have a lot more horsepower on your head. Whereas if you wanted to have a lot of horsepower on your head and be completely untethered, you'd start getting a very, what, a very heavy headset with a lot of heat issues and so forth? There aren't actually, the, the place where we are with Moore's Law, there aren't actually processors that are strong enough to give you the horsepower you'd need yeah. to visualize like a, a 5 million polygon model of a building uh, in San Francisco that you're pitching to an investor, for example. Yeah. And a lot, that was a huge use case from, for example, Gensler, uh, the largest architecture firm uh, that uh, bought the Meta One and is mm -hmm. now partnered with the Meta Two. Um, so there are certain use cases that you just can't put on board. But even if you could, one of the reasons we're lighter than the Hololens is is because um, you don't have a battery and you don't right. you don't you don't have the compute on board. And so there's a weight issue, there's a thermals, there's a heat issue. Things get really hot up there if if you have a, a battery. And so my life right now, before it's a strip of glass, is a series of trade-offs. Yeah. And I think the art and the fun part, the creative part uh, for, for a guy like me is to decide between, you know, all of these these trade-offs and uh, to sometimes say, you know, it's okay to 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 lax uh, uh, one of these parameters. And you've definitely created something that you wear for how many hours a day on average, would you yeah. say? So I currently wear it um, essentially during the, the business day uh, fully, so. And you've got, uh, describe the workspace. I've seen it um, in the demo that we went through and, and just also seeing your office, but describe the workspace that you lay out for yourself in AR space using your headset. I'm gonna hack into the brains of the audience for a moment and I'm gonna use a very hackneyed uh, image or, or uh, word, which is Iron Man. Let's all visualize Iron Man's workshop for a moment or Minority Report interfaces where Tom Cruise is using those gloves to swipe through a bunch of panels. Um, the meta workspace is something that is quite similar to that experience in that you can render with near photorealism a a tab of a your email and place it right in front of you. But uh, just as readily with our air grab technology, you can stretch that monitor to be larger than anything that you can buy in an Apple store. And so you have this gigantic 50 inch holographic monitor in front of you. And then you could pull a tab of a calendar and put it over your head facing down. You could start uh, spatializing your thoughts. Our motto here is think spatial. So go ahead and take a Facebook panel and uh, throw it to the side and, and you have this mental molecule of um, of activities with flat two D panels surrounding you, but then it gets really crazy and fun. So you can create like a trader's workstation with multiple panels in front of you. And I'll say, um, you know, for the benefit of folks, obviously, who is everybody who is listening as opposed to seeing this stuff. I was really surprised by how crisp. Um, the rendering was when I when I put on the headset and looked at the screen. It's like, yeah, that's like looking at a computer screen, <laughs> which I really didn't expect. <laughs> me neither. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah. When I when we started, when the when the optics team came to me with the earliest prototypes, um, I was I was expecting something that was a linear progression from the Meta One, but it became evident that we're in an, this exponential economy. So you use that as your computer monitor. Yes. When you When you are looking through the working day, you're looking at a computer monitor. It's through your headset. And you use a, a Bluetooth keyboard, I assume, yeah. for input? We use a keyboard and, a, and um, sometimes I use the mouse, although I could tap the panels with my fingers as well. Yep. Yeah, I take it on the go, I run it on a laptop. It's it's pretty it's pretty crazy. Uh you know, the 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 real aha moment is when I was sitting on a on a flight and it was a, it was a business class seat so the TV was pretty big, you know, one of those places where you don't typically miss screen real estate. But then you put on the headset and you're surrounded by 14 panels and it's just like it, it's that that's the aha moment that mm -hmm. uh, I just untethered myself from uh, the shackles of the cubicle. And I think the entire workforce needs to be on this train pretty, pretty quickly. And what are the dimensions of your desk? 
Your physical desk? Oh, my physical desk. Yeah. So we designed a physical desk to match this holographic workspace. It's the, the height of it is um, about the length of an A4 piece of paper. So it's, it's a narrow desk. Or the depth of it. The, uh, the depth of it. Yeah. Correct. Correct. The depth of it. It's about, uh, what, what would you estimate that? Eight like inches? A foot. It's yeah. like, a, yeah, it's maybe, like a maybe foot. a bit more. Yeah. yeah. Maybe about 12. Yeah. And, um, and it's about 10 feet long. It's basically a plank. It's a slab of redwood. Yeah, it's basically you work at a plank. I work at a plank. Yeah, because you don't have a CR, you don't have a monitor, you don't, you don't really use paper, as far as I can tell. Yeah, yeah, right. So it's there's the we designed along with uh, Steve Mann, the inventor of wearable computing, this new desk for the monitorless worker, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't need to house monitors. That's why the desk has depth. Um, and because we can take a holographic panel and lay it on its back and we can even take input devices like, um, digital pens and draw on the desk, we expect that with a few more spins of Moore's law, one wouldn't need paper as much. Mm -hmm. Um, and so, uh, this long slab of redwood becomes my entire productivity space. Yeah. Um, and I face it against the window, which is now we're sitting on the top of a mountain overlooking all of Silicon Valley. And um, the world is my desktop background, right? That's kind of the idea of spatial computing and, and the power that it holds. And how many of the folks who work here like you? I know I've seen people around the office as we were walking around. In fact, when we walked in the door, the receptionist was doing what you do and was had her, her headset on. Um, of the 150-ish people who work here, roughly how many would you estimate are more or less in a headset environment throughout the day as opposed to using a traditional monitor? We're at about 50 now. Five, 50 people. 50 people. Out of the 150. Yep, yep. That's wild. That is really <laughs> wild. And it is something to walk into an office and see lots of people doing that. It's like... Wait until you come here next year. Next year when we throw away these oppressive cubicles uh, that we inherited from GoPro, it will be a very different looking office because the very idea of work is going to be transformed by spatial computing. I estimate that when you go into the office of the future, you're going to have a bunch of engineers clustered around having a conversation like we are around this round table, looking at a hologram of a visual molecule of their methods mm -hmm. uh, of, and the classes of their algorithm. And it's going to be a collaborative thing. And in the other side of the office, you'll see a cluster of people looking around at a 3D model of our Meta 3. Yep. And it's um, and in the boardroom, you'll see a bunch of holographic board members f flying in for the day. Um, that's the kind of setting that is, and this is hard to imagine because we all have linear brains and we're expecting next year to look kind of like last year. Um, in an exponential economy, that becomes possible. And so the demo that you've seen today, the, the workspace, which is no longer really a demo, it's how we do work here. Yeah. Um, next year will become, you know, order of magnitude more powerful. So where's all this heading over the next five or six years? Fundamentally, if you look at our mission statement, you look in the hallways here, you'll see um, it's driving towards a zero learning curve computing experience. Pinch to zoom is just a slightly more intuitive way to, to move around a photograph. It follows the same metaphor as if I was moving around this piece of paper on the desk and the same as stretching through Play-Doh. The, by, by simplifying computing with that one gesture that cost Samsung a billion dollars in lawsuits, um, uh, they were able to increase the bandwidth. Apple was able to increase the bandwidth between man and machine because suddenly my grandmother, who never had access to computing in the past, she couldn't figure out the Windows 95 uh, operating system, was able to engage with computing. So by extension, we believe you can make the entire operating system cognitively healthy, if you will, or engaging with algorithms that you have innately in your mind. And you believe that that is the history of computing up until now. Right? Absolutely. A continual yeah. increase in the bandwidth between man and machine. And even the physical regions of the brain that light up Correct. with one user interface being succeeded by the next. So let's go back to the punch card, right? Punch card and follow the history of successful user interfaces and paradigm shifters all the way up to AR and predict what will happen moving forward from AR. So it starts with a punch card. It's abstract. It's symbolic. Um, it's not engaging any part of your brain beyond the symbolic regions. Um, and then we go on to uh, the command line interface, as we remember them from DOS and, 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 and the terminal. Um, here, you're using... 
human language. So the computer begins speaking the human language, except the type of syntax you need to memorize is highly computer-esque. You have to remember DEL space, the name of the file space, you know, et cetera, et cetera, uh, semicolon. And if you get this wrong, then you're actually going to miss entirely. So well, it's like speaking a foreign language. So that's kind of like Bracaz area. Is it Bracaz area? <laughs> Did I say it right? I'm not sure what you're referring oh, to. Oh, it's part of the ba it's part of the brain. B R O C A Broca's. Oh, Broca's. Yeah, so that's Broca's, what I was I don't getting know how to, to pronounce it. Okay, yeah, yeah, okay. Broca's all right. Okay. Broca's and verticals are the area that the both of the areas that are engaged when one is performing language tasks, and that is the 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 area that began lighting up. Uh, with the in, command line. With the command line, and then we move forward. So now we get into the Apple II. Uh, so let's move forward a little bit more. Let's say the Lisa and the Macintosh. We have the Windows GUI, the Windows Graphical User Interface, that was invented in Xerox Park in 1972, right? And some of Doug Engelbart's pioneering work from 68. And these are now iconography, but that start resembling real world metaphors, like a window that I move around or a garbage can. So that DEL could become this pixelated black and white image that sort of reminds me of a garbage can. So I could now drag a file into it, but there's uh, still a lot of abstraction and symbolism. I have to right click on that garbage can, read a string of text, say I'm confirming that I'm throwing away this, this file. And so uh, the the bad news is we're still stuck in abstraction and symbolism, and we're still speaking the computer's language. They're not speaking our language. But we're out of Broca's area. But we're out of Broca's area. Where, now, where are we now? We're, we're, now? we're in this Windows GUI world. What part of the brain have we now colonized? Right. So now um, there is a part of the visual system called the ventral pathway. Mm -hmm. the, ventral, the visual system is divided into two. The ventral pathway, which is your object recognition algorithm of the mind, mm -hmm. if you will, or pathway. And um, that one is deciphering what this pixelated garbage essentially is is telling us that it is a which is a higher garbage. bandwidth interaction than just using Broca's area. Exactly. So, yeah, so it's a step uh, forward. It's yeah. a step forward. And underneath it, it says garbage. So I'm using Broca's and uh, yeah, uh, uh, it's uh, additive. Broca's and Vernicus and the, so it's additive, exactly. So you're noticing this pattern. We now have symbolism for bunch cards. We have Vernicus and Vernicus. We have uh, the ventral pathway. And all of these algorithms of, of the mind are engaging. Now, Windows 95, the next successful one, gives you shadow, depth, color. This garbage can starts resembling a real garbage can. Which was so exciting for me. <laughs> <laughs> pop uh, right off the screen. Wait yeah. until you see our I AR know. garbage can. I, I can't wait. I can't wait. <laughs> It'd be dumpsters. It'd be veritable dumpsters. Yeah, they're going to be, uh, you'll practically be able to smell them. So the, uh, the idea is that now we're engaging that object recognition algorithm more um, robustly. Mm -hmm. So um, uh, we continue further. Now we have pinch to zoom. Grandma is engaging with computing for the very first time. And famously, preschoolers who have not been taught how to use it can use it. Yeah. So, exactly. Yeah. Right. And these folks are um, getting haptic feedback uh, mm -hmm. by uh, engaging with their somatosensory cortex. So that's the new region that we have now colonized, the somatosensory cortex. Amen. And I'm sure I'm going to say, it's wrong, say it incorrectly, like I said, Brokaw's region wrong, but it's parietal lobe. Parietal. Parietal. See, there we go. Yeah, yeah. No, I no, used no. to say when I was when I was a kid, I used to say all kinds of words wrong because I learned them out of books. Now I'm learning things on Wikipedia and I'm saying them wrong too. But now, augmented reality. I have a feeling a new brain path is about to light up. Okay. I mentioned there's this first part of the visual system called the ventral pathway, mm -hmm. uh, which is your what pathway. It's answering questions of what are you looking at right now? This bottle of water, this microphone, etc. And now we're going to introduce a new pathway, which has been completely neglected by computing thus far, called the dorsal pathway. The dorsal pathway starts in your eyeball, goes to the back of your occipital lobe in the very back of your, of your skull, and travels on the top of your cortex all the way to your prefrontal cortex. It's a much longer and, uh, I think, more multifaceted, fascinating pathway of the mind. It answers question of what questions of where am I relative to my environment? So it's the where pathways. It's, it's the where the pathway. pathway. Nailed it. Yeah. Nailed it. And <laughs> it's it's also the how pathway. How do I interact uh, with my environment? Um, so where I'm localizing myself relative to my environment, how I'm grabbing this bottle in a particular way. Okay. It also handles questions like it it, uh, it culminates in your visual working memory. So when you're looking in the example we mentioned earlier at tabs spatialized around you instead of cluttered on top of each other, um, they're being decluttered by your prefrontal cortex, which is the very ending of that dorsal pathway. 
So I know we're running low on time now, and I want to be respectful of that. And what's great is that a more perfect transition to the next episode of this podcast couldn't be imagined because its topic is going to be neuroscience and consciousness. And my guest will be someone I know you know well, Dr. Adam Ghazali of UCSF. And I'm sure Adam and I will be discussing many brain regions. So with that, I'd like to thank you profusely because this conversation has been incredibly good. Thank you very much. You're welcome. So that, Tom, was my interview with Marone Gribbets of Meta. My brain is a light. Uh, and it sounds like we're not far off from what we see in the first section of After On, about maybe five years. Now that we know what really is going on with augmented reality, let's talk about what it is that Mitchell and friends discover in the book. And I want to start with some of your preparation, by the way. Spoiler warning. We will be now talking about things that happened in the book. So if you haven't read After On, you might want to bail out now. You attended a recent AR conference in New York City, right? Uh, yeah, it was a conference that uh, Marone actually spoke at, which was held at NYU called AR in Action. It was a couple of days, and it was really a remarkable gathering, um, a who's who of the industry. So what most struck you about the emerging technologies in this field? You know, the thing that surprised me is that AR is getting very, very 3D and hologram oriented. Uh, for years, I and I think most of us thought of AR as being fundamentally a 2D phenomenon of, you know, information and data overlays. I think the original Google Glass video that showed us sort of a see what's possible video on Google Glass that was very widespread trained us to, to think of it that way in a sense. Um, in in, in that video, everything that was popping up was little bits of information and that kind of thing. But Meta definitely, and I would say that the industry writ large, is definitely thinking more in terms of holograms and photorealistic 3D elements that can be placed on the scene environment. Um, this is a much bigger lift. Uh, it is much easier to put data that I can use or little information bits in front of my eyes than a photorealistic hologram that's on the correct side of the uncanny valley. They're not making them things easy for themselves in that regard, but I definitely admire their ambition. Yeah, and augmented reality is is used quite loosely. Uh, you you have everything from the Hololens to uh, Apple's AR Kit to Pokemon Go. Everyone always uses Pokemon Go, which a lot of people in the AR industry go, "Well, that's not really augmented reality." Uh, and that goes right up to the strip of glass that Marone described, and that you ended up putting in your novel. Yeah, in an earlier conversation that we had in New York. Um, Marone gave a really good breakdown of what he considers to be three different types of AR. The first he called baby AR, which is Pokemon Go or other Neantic games like Ingress and so forth. I might even call it flashlight AR. It's like your phone is this narrow beam, but instead of illuminating a small section of a dark room, it's illuminating this hidden AR layer, but you can only see it through a few degrees of your field of view. It's a little bit more than a novelty or a stunt, but in my view, not a lot more. Um, next is what Marone calls, and I think this is a good turn of phrase, the notification machine. And that would be Google Glass, for instance, something that is basically, and also I'd add the, the Apple Watch is a notification machine. It, it's basically making little press releases and announcements that you might find useful in your field of view. And it's a very, very 2D thing. The third is what Marone personally calls the natural machine, which is embedding photorealistic holograms into your vision in a way that truly does augment reality and tries to be integral with a reality. So when you're creating AR for the book... You must have had one of those models in mind. Yeah, I, I had the, the natural machine in mind, although I didn't yet have the word for it. And the reason for this is I wanted to envision an AR system that could potentially deliver enough value to the end user to be an economically successful product. I mean, the costs, basically, if AR is to succeed like anything else, the cost-benefit equation has to work. The costs are the actual monetary cost of the device and also how much you annoy people by using it, either by looking stupid or by pissing them off by obtrusively wearing a piece of technology they find creepy. And the benefits, so though they're the cost, the benefits are in the value of the information and services that get rendered to your eyes. Um, 
Google Glass was a flaming 0 for 3. It was very, very expensive. It looked awful and it creeped people out. The AR spectacles in the book were at least a 2 for 3. There wasn't any speculation about how much they cost in the book, but they were relatively cost less to wear because they didn't look stupid and no one knew you had anything going on, except Dana, of course, because she's kind of omniscient in that scene. So it wasn't that they were uncreepy. It was that they were invisibly creepy. And secondarily, the data and the services that rendered on top of them are, of course, very powerful. And so that's why I found this, as Marone calls it, natural machine category of spectacles interesting. I could see them working in the marketplace, delivering more value than they cost. And I was actually, I didn't have a time frame in my mind when I started writing this. I was rather surprised that Marone put this definitively five years, definitely, no question, Mr. Reed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. it's interesting. Now, the other side of this is why use augmented reality and not to spoil future parts of the book, but this device is a device to bring us into a, a company and, and, a, and another section that's very important to the book. But you could have used other technologies. Yeah. Why did you pick AR? This is, um, you know, th this is really one of, and I tried to count them and I hope I did it right. There's only three-ish times in the book in which I actually practice science fiction, which is taking things that are, are improbable or impossible to happen today and pulling them into the present tense. And I don't think I ever go more than five years out. So this is one of the few. And the reason that I wanted to focus on this is privacy and network omniscience in the digital age are very, very big themes of the book. And I'm personally intrigued and chilled by the fact that this is coming to the world, something I think I mentioned briefly in the interview with Marone, the fact that we're going to be able to affix all of the information that the internet itself knows about us to physical human beings as they navigate the world, that's a very, very powerful thing. And I actually first started worrying about this very issue many, many years ago. Um, I had a very good friend who was quite senior in the engineering ranks at Google. And I came in and he was gracious enough to give me a Nexus phone really early in that cycle. In fact, he told me he was pretty sure that my Nexus phone was the first one to walk off the Google campus, not in the hands of a Google employee. So I had that thing real early. And they had this sort of kind of internal app, which was face, facial recognition. This was long before Facebook got real good at it and stuff. So it was kind of like having a Newton and trying to think of where palm-based computing would go. It was very early, but as soon as I saw that, I was like, man, people are going to use this to get definitive identification of strangers and bars and cafes and other places. And it's going to be, you know, we're going into a, a, a scary future yeah. when people can be very firmly identified by anybody who cares to do it. So it's actually something I've been wrestling with for a while. And when you can do it with utterly unobtrusive glasses, it clearly uh, elevates to a much creepier issue than if you're shoving a phone in somebody's face because they're not going to miss that. Yeah. And, and you don't have to reach into a pocket, right? It's just yeah. sitting on your face. Sitting on your face. Uh, and I liked what Marone said about, well, everyone will know what everyone else is seeing if it's a shared space. Mm -hmm. But even so... I mean, in this current world where we all see where everyone else is looking, people can still creep people out. Yeah. So yeah. did you talk to women about how they'd feel about augmented reality being used on them in the way that it's used on Dana? Yeah, starting when I saw that first Nexus phone, um, it's something that I've brought up with lots of folks. And um, the reaction is generally, huh, I don't know that I want to go to the future anymore. <laughs> um, and that is what, what Marone's, uh, I, I like the term, I like the term he came up with public by default, and I like the concept. Um, it would be mighty hard to implement. It would be hard, mighty hard to get everybody to sign up for the notion that that which I'm seeing is going to be somehow displayed to the outside world. People would find workarounds and so forth. But I give them credit that it is, it is a very forward-thinking idea. It would be something that if there was a public by default mode and people adhered to it, and it was some way visible enough that it would be awkward to just be looking at things that you really shouldn't be in the presence of other people, I think that that would have a very powerful dampening effect. Devils in the details, I don't know how you would implement it. I don't know how you would prevent hackers from working around it. But it is, it is an intriguing idea. And um, given that he's in a position as a CEO of a leading AR company, 
to be one of the leading beneficiaries from the proliferation of AR, the fact that he's thinking about things that would really, frankly, hobble the advantages of having an AR system on your head, I, I think it's, I, I give him props for that. Yeah. I mean, I obviously malicious hackers uh, or, or even non-malicious hackers are always trying to figure out ways around things. So that's no matter what technology we talk about, that's going to be an aspect of yes. it. Yes. Uh, I compared what he was saying to wearing a mask in public. Mm. Uh, if, if you can get, like you say, if you can get the social engineering of this such that someone showing up and being flagged as not public by default makes everyone look and go, wait, what are you doing? Here? Oh, what are you up to? Because if someone walks in a room with a mask, right. you say, well, wait a minute. Why, why are you wearing a mask? Yes, I can't see your identity, but I know I can't see your identity and I don't trust that. Right, right. Oh, that's actually a really interesting idea because then basically... The I am not public by defaultness of the person is highly visible. Yeah. And you don't have to worry. I mean, you still, the public by default has got to be in some way, I don't know, auditable or I'm not sure what it would be. But that, that you don't have to make as much of a statement about the fact that somebody is public by default. It's funny. When I was, um, years ago, I traveled through Singapore and the taxis there, there was a system whereby if a taxi driver started to speed, a little light started flashing on the roof of the car and a very gentle gonging started to go off on the interior of the car. It was only taxis. It wasn't private cars, but it made very clear to everybody on the road and in the backseat of the taxi, this taxi driver is speeding. That's kind of public by default. Yeah. And I got to say it worked. There were not a lot of speeding taxi drivers in Singapore. <laughs> I, I had the same uh, experience in Seoul. Coming oh, really? From, from Incheon Airport into Seoul. And the guy didn't care. He just, they just kept gonging away. And he would just look. And then when he'd see like, oh, there might be a cop up there, he'd slow back down <laughs> underneath. So. But he wasn't hiding his speeding. No, he you couldn't. Know? Right. And my guess is that there is a certain percentage of customers um, who would probably say, stop speeding. Yeah. My dearly departed great aunt would be one of them. She just would, you yeah. know. And so. my wife was, no, keep, keep going. As Step on it. If the bell's not it. going yeah. off, there's something wrong yeah. with your driving, mister. We're in I a think hurry. That they both saw the gong as a confirmation that, that we he was were... driving properly. Yeah, yeah. Good, 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 good. All right. Let's talk about how the competitive landscape is shaping up uh, for, for AR here. Yeah, so um, we didn't really talk about anybody other than HoloLens in the interview with Maroon, as you heard, um, partly because the other major player, uh, Magic Leap, as we mentioned briefly in the interview, has yet to ship a product. They've raised over a billion dollars. Um, there are two smaller players that I find interesting. Um, they're called ODG, that's a San Francisco-based company, and then a company called Lumus, L-U-M-U-S. Um, they're quieter. They seem to me to be, and I, I do not pretend to be an expert on either one of those companies, but they seem to be more um, optical companies to me. I don't see them making the full software ecosystem that HoloLens and Meta are both making. Um, they don't see them doing the hand, you know, the, the software that tracks your hand when it's in front of your face. I don't believe they're creating their own OSs. I believe they're both Android based. So they're interesting, but I, I put them in a different category. Um, but, you know, I think maybe the most interesting competitors are the ones who have yet to enter, or in the case of Google, re-enter the market. Um, it is very clear that Apple has a lot going on in AR. Uh, Scott Cook, I did a little research, recently told Businessweek on the subject of AR, quote, I think it is profound. I am so excited about it. I just want to yell out and scream. And <laughs> I know, have never seen measuring tapes get so many people yes, excited as yes, the ones exactly. that were made in AR. Case. And I said Scott Cook, as I always do when I mean Tim Cook. I, I just wired to say the well, his friends call into Scott. it. Yeah. Well, <laughs> Scott Cook started into it, and that's just burnt into my, my brain. So Tim Cook, not Scott Cook. I'm sure Scott Cook is also excited about I'm AR. Sure he is, yeah. And they announced AR Kit. Apple announced AR Kit, their AR API at the Worldwide Development Conference in June. Um, it will be in iOS uh, 11. Um, it will be a huge refinement on Pokemon Go Grade AR. You just made the reference to right. the IKEA applicant. You want to talk about that because it is really well, cause, interesting. Because Pokemon Go just put a character in your field of view. It didn't yeah. actually place it on the ground where you could walk around it and things like that. It didn't have any yeah. kind of connection to the world rendered Which by the camera. Which is why people say it's not really augmented reality. Yeah. What AR Kit is doing is saying, you know, we'll put a rocket ship on your coffee table and you right. can get up and walk around it and see the nose cone from and different the tail perspectives. and, and yeah. see it from all the different perspectives. And the two apps that got uh, recent excitement were ones where it would lay a measuring tape down and give you an accurate measurement of what you're seeing with just the one camera. 
Which is kind of cool. But I then mean, there was also the Ikea one, right? Oh, the, the Ikea one was the one shown on stage at WWDC where you can actually put your furniture in different parts of your actual apartment and right. see if it fits. In which case, I kind of personally think I'd rather see it on my 30-inch monitor than my phone. Cool as it might be to walk around it and well, so forth. Well, that's the thing is if I can put it in the corner and then walk up and then nudge it, you know, yeah. move it, I, yeah. I could start to see it. I don't want to have to be holding that phone. It's though. the flashlight AR. You yeah. need the natural machine. Um, but anyway, Apple is clearly dead serious about it. They have, uh, from what all accounts um, maintain, a very talented team, a large team. They're not skimping. So Apple is going to be in there. I think if it's a safe guess that Google will probably reenter the space with something that's less ill-conceived than Google Glass. Yeah. Who knows? And we finally fewer, have real the Project Tango, Tango phones. Yeah, they, yeah, yeah. They, they, they have their Tango platform. Um, you know, Facebook, will they be content with AR or with VR? Will they get in? I mean, maybe even Snapchat. So I think the shoes that have yet to drop yeah. are, are all significant ones. At this very moment, I've got to say, I've used HoloLens. I've used Meta. I'm far more impressed with Meta. Um, I thought Marone said some very, very smart and very generous things in the interview about what he believes HoloLens is better at. But the, the simple case of the 90 degree field of view that Meta offers versus this very narrow, almost like kind of largish TV screen like view uh, that HoloLens offers is just a very, very different degree of how much envel how enveloped you get. And I just respect, I always respect the, the underdog. I mean, you know, Meta has got a great deal of talent. They've raised less than a tenth as much money as Magic Leap. They've been shipping for years. They are nowhere near the resources of Microsoft. They have a far better product at this moment. Um, I was very impressed with what I've seen, and I think that they are going to be a force to be reckoned with for quite some time in this domain. Now, we, uh, we do want to talk about a few other things in this section of the book that may not be directly related to AR. Mm -hmm. And I want to I start off with my own question, Rob. Yes. Did you write the Net Girl column or did you use a meta secret contributor? You need to be honest. This is for posterity. Now, are you asking this because the, the written voice is so not my own or so not that of the it's, others? It is so Net Girl. And yes. Net Girl is a mysterious contributor. Mysterious, I yeah. love the idea yeah. that you had a mysterious contributor. Yep. Uh, no, I wrote every word in Damn, this book. That's yeah, good stuff. I, I wrote the Net Girl stuff and I thought it was very voicey. Um, to use a word that comes up a couple of times in the book. And uh, I thought it was so voicey that I worked very hard and succeeded in recruiting Felicia Day to read the Net Girl parts in the audiobook, which I'm pretty excited about. Yeah, I'm yeah. excited about that too, actually. Uh, and the book, we should talk about the very beginning, because I, I had actually forgotten this part until I went back and, and reread it. But you start with a dare mm -hmm. uh, and a narrator. Yes, and, uh, you know, the dare is to finish the fucker in the words of the narrator. <laughs> um, and it is, it is a long book as we all know. And yeah, the narrator, um, writes in a voice that is so pompous. I just want to find this person and hit them. And then I realize, oh, I wrote that. Uh, but this is, it's important to know that this is the narrator of the book. This is not an author introduction. And, um, you know, this person, true to true to their word, um, does say, hey, I'm going to get out of the way now. You know, I'll be back when you least expect it. And does come mm -hmm. in and poke the reader from time to time to remind the reader, hey, there's a narrator here. Don't forget about the narrator. I'm the narrator. Yeah. Um, and but, you're going to wonder about that narrator. Yes, you were going to wonder until very, very, very late in the book. And that's all I'll say for now. Uh, also... We, in these first 50 pages, uh, start to realize that there are lots of voices in this. Uh, in fact, we get a series of excerpts from an entirely different novel. Yes, we do. Um, so, uh, and they start very, very early. So since we're, we're notionally reviewing the first 51 pages of the novel right now, um, I believe that at this stage of the novel, there have been not one but three excerpts uh, from this very, very agitated novel about uh, secret agent Brock Hogan. Brock Hogan. Brock Hogan. And um, in writing that, I, I, I really, if I ever finish this novel, and I certainly do not intend to, I, I, I love the world too much, but if I did, I think there are decent odds that it would be the single worst science fiction novel ever written. And uh, so that's sort of like an aspirational thing there. And 
if you were wondering in reading that, or if anybody's run, wondering in reading it, if I'm spoofing anybody in the way that I write it, the answer is I am spoofing Rob Reed. Um, <laughs> many, many, many years ago, uh, I started writing my first novel, as lots of people do at early stages of their lives, and I rediscovered it um, early in the process of writing this, my second novel, um, my second real novel. Like that novel that I wrote many years ago never got finished, thank God. And there were six or seven just horrific stylistic and grammatical sins that I repeated just constantly in this very proto-Neanderthal writing of mine. Lots of double negatives. Uh, I was constitutionally incapable of using the word said, so it had to be opined, conjectured, you know, contextualized, whatever it was. Um, there were some really egregious cases of uh, thesaurus overuse um, and lots of other things. I mean, I don't want to identify everything. Um, but yeah, so I was tickled by these these sort of stylistic flourishes and decided to use them and also just obviously a very stentorian, cartoonish kind of dated voice to tell these very agitated uh, to create these very agitated passes, passages. But um, as with Net Girl, this will very much integrate with the book, uh, much, much deeper into the book. These are very much part of the storytelling and the identity of the mysterious writer of these passages will become revealed, much as the identity of eventually uh, the narrator and Net Girl will eventually become revealed. So you have to know the rules to break them. You yes. have to really know the rules to bust them and destroy them, oh. as you did with Brock Hogan. And with one fun thing, the Agent Brock Hogan pieces are read by none other than Patrick Rothfuss, uh, a fabulous fantasy writer, um, who authored The Name of the Wind, uh, among other works. And he does a great job of putting these into this really, you know, kind of brutish voice. Would you care to have a listen right now? I would love to, because when I write and I catch myself breaking one of said rules that you've talked about, it's Patrick Rothfuss's voice in my head that is telling me what I have done wrong. So I can't wait to hear him give voice to this story. Well, here we have a brief Brief excerpt from the audiobook, Patrick Rothfuss, reading the Agent Brock Hogan novel. Special field operative Brock Hogan hated having to drag that tightly muscled six-foot, three-inch frame of his across countless time zones back to headquarters. Yet he always came when summoned, not because any Langley pencil pusher had the first thing to teach him about spycraft, close-in-combat geopolitics, nor indeed about pushing pencils. Wasn't it he, after all, who had covertly kiboshed the blood-spattered career of a certain rabble-rousing moolah by pressing a graphite number two stylus right into his carotid artery mere moments before he was to incite a region-wide conflagration by broadcasting a scripture-twisting fatwa from that notorious jihadi radio station deep in darkest Iran? Unarmed and stark naked after escaping sadistic interrogation in a nearby terrorist bunker, Agent Hogan had coolly canvassed the benign offerings of an office supply closet for repurposable materiel, then wordlessly waylaid his unexpectant foe in an empty hallway en route to the control room. Mightier than the sword after all, wouldn't you say? he uttered unironically as he withdrew the dripping shaft from the fallen Fedayeen, who could respond only by moaning and writhing through the climax of his death throes. So no, not even the most decorated Langley bureaucrat could ever dream of pushing a pencil with half his aplomb. Yet Agent Hogan dutifully returned to HQ whenever summoned by those cringing desk jockeys, because he was, above all, a loyal warrior, and loyal warriors respect the chain of command, however contemptible and backstabbing certain so-called superiors might be. As usual, a veritable grand powwow was convened to debrief him, and so every leather-bound swivel chair in the agency's largest conference room was hoisting some panjandrum's posterior when Hogan arrived several dozen minutes late, as was his devil-may-care habit. His piercing blue wide-set eyes took instant mental inventory of those present, 
lingering perhaps an extra picosecond on the fecund curves of a certain Chinese-featured female assassin with whom he enjoyed occasional sexual congress, then perhaps twice that duration upon one most unexpected attendee. Dr. Phillips, he intoned, his left brow arched with a muted irony, which divulged that, beneath its playful, almost mocking surface, he in fact held a deep, if not ungrudging, well of respect for the portly, gray-headed, and wizened, brown-eyed gentleman whom he addressed. This is most unexpected. That is amazing. Yes. Um, I, okay, so and you've you've made some bets here with the reader, uh, and you dare them at the beginning. So the cards are on the table that you're going to throw a lot of things at them that will take a little while to pay off, take a little while to cohere, mm-hmm. for lack of a better word. So how do you want to tell the audience to like hang in there? Is it good enough to have that narrator at the beginning? or You know, it's just an enormous amount of sex scenes that are going to start <laughs> immediately on page 52 and reward people for hanging in there. You know, I, I've read a lot of books where I, I like a book that's a puzzle personally. And no book is for everybody, and this book is not for everybody. I mean, this book may be for fewer people than most books. It's certainly for fewer people than, you know, I don't know, Fifty Shades of Grey and other books like that. But I personally really enjoy a book that takes a while to figure out who the parties are, what the elements are, what the backstory is. And this is this is a bit of a puzzle. It's yeah. it's not um I enjoyed that. When I was reading yeah. these first fifty pages and I ran into the Amazon reviews and I ran into Brock Hogan, I was like, okay, I I'm fine with these just being little standalone inserts, but I'm also wondering if there's anything more to them. And that that was fun. And they come together, they're, they're persistent presences. And so um, actually at this stage of the book, we have not yet gotten to the Amazon reviews. We'll probably discuss those in so our next spoilers. episode. They're very soon. Spoiler, you're getting an Amazon review. It doesn't you're, really matter. You're getting an Amazon long. review or 18. <laughs> you may be getting a dozen and a half Amazon reviews. Um, but there's, there's only a handful of these semi-mysterious presences and they have very distinctive voices and they come back repeatedly yeah. and you, there are slow reveals on all of them. I think when it becomes wholly evident, you know, what is behind each of these things with the exception of the Amazon reviews, that kind of, that's kind of divulged all at once. Um, I think there'll be sort of like, a satisfying, oh yeah, that makes sense. I kind of felt that coming. I can testify that that was my feeling yeah. myself. And hopefully they're enjoyable in and of themselves. Like Personally, I think Brock Hogan just gets more and more <laughs> revoltingly politically incorrect, more well, grammatically yes. tortured, more preposterous, and just whenever I feel like he just can't cross another line, there he goes. You've, you've made him a train wreck that you have to watch to the point that towards the end of his story... You're actually into the story a little. I'd which like is to think so. Pretty, pretty crazy. I'd like to think uh, so. One other character that does come in in these last 50 segments is something that, or segments, these last 50 pages, is somebody you may recognize if you read Rob Reed's Year Zero. It's the only crossover character. Oh, one there, of two. Okay, one of two, one of yep. two crossover characters. Uh, Pugwash. Pugwash, yes. Pugwash the Evil Cousin. Uh, Pugwash was the evil cousin of Nick Carter, the narrator of Year Zero, and he is the evil cousin of Mitchell Prentice, the non-narrator protagonist. He's everyone's favorite evil cousin. He is. He has got a lot of cousins. I'm beginning to realize as I get to know him better. I mean, both Nick Carter and Mitchell Prentice, in their own ways, noted that they're parts of very large families. And I think if you run the math on Pugwash, um, you realize very quickly that he has probably dozens of first cousins and maybe it will be my life's literary work to tell the to- this tale of every pugwash cousin and have pugwash come in and do cameos but yes pugwash indeed appears in both books there will be another crossover character uh rearing her head um a couple hundred pages further along and there are a couple of hooks that people who are observant might actually see in the book that relate to other elements. And I'm just going to be vague about that for now. All right. Uh, Well, folks, you are free, if you haven't already, to leap into the next 50 pages. 
Uh, and next time we meet, we will discuss neuroscience and consciousness. We will indeed, with a fabulously talented neuroscientist, a gentleman named Adam Ghazali from UCSF, um, who I believe is probably regarded as being one of the top neuroscientists of his generation. He was an amazing asset to me as I was researching this book. And um, it's great to get deep into his views on consciousness, uh, his take on where the field of neuroscience is right now, um, because that does per pertain to the storyline of the book. And it's just pretty darn fascinating in and of itself. That's next time at the same location where you got this podcast, wherever that may be. And of course, you can find out more about After On at after-on.com. Thank you all for listening.